All Things Alice. This podcast will explore the cultural phenomenon of Alice in Wonderland as artistic landmark and global symbol of inspiration and imagination. I'm your host, Frank Bedore, the author of the Looking Glass Wars trilogy. Let's explore what is it about Alice? Hey, everybody. It's Frank Bedore here, ready to record another episode of All Things Alice. I'm thrilled to have my next guest, Chris Monfett, who is a super talented writer. He's currently the co-executive producer of Star Trek Picard, which has just completed its third season. He's written numerous comic books. He's worked with Clive Barker. So we're going to be talking about writing. We're going to be talking about comic books. We're going to be talking about the writer's strike, finding our way through surviving that, and of course, coming up with your creative voice and how Alice in Wonderland has influenced Chris in his work. So let's jump in. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. I'm excited to talk to you. I didn't realize... Well, I had forgotten how long ago it was that we first uh, came into contact with each other. I don't even remember how we we got. I was trying to remember this the other day. How we got introduced? Um, it was, I, I, and I can't. I can't remember the circumstances. Well, you worked at I, IGN. And, IGN. And Steve Horn did a right. pretty big interview with me. I'm still not convinced that he introduced us, but you wrote, (laughs) either you wrote a review of the second episode, the second issue of Hatter, or we did an interview. I think you read it. I I think you wrote a review. And I also knew you through Suckle. Oh. uh, uh, Because Suckle was was on 12 Monkeys. and, And so... That may be a connection as well. I think that was afterwards. Uh, okay. I, I think right. uh, I, I remember. Yes, you, that would have been afterwards for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You wrote something that I you wrote a review that was was positive, but not gushing. But I like the <laughs> way that you phrased the some of the uh, some of Hatter's adventure, and I was interested in uh, getting together. Oh, okay, all right. Um, well. And, I'm sorry. I'll make, I should have made it more positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I appreciated the sort of straight up honesty of it. And um, and then I, I liked it so much. You know, I think I reached out to you about, uh, yeah, about, about working together. So a- anyway, I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. I'm, uh, no, I'm, I'm excited to talk. I mean, it is all things Alice, except it's really turned into a podcast a, a lot about pop culture and yeah, and yeah. Uh, television, and uh, you're deep into uh, Picard. Uh, yeah. So I was curious where where you left off with the show, given the strike, and what your state of mind is uh, in this. <laughs> are you on the picket lines? Are you? Yeah, I. Are well, you stressed? I'll say this. You know, it's 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 a harrowing. So you know, we were lucky in in terms of in terms of Picard because Patrick had only wanted to do three seasons and so we knew you know they knew rather kind of going into it because i didn't come in until the second season you know that it would be three and out three and done and so there was a really unique structure to picard where it was kind of handed off from showrunner to showrunner for three seasons in a row like michael shaban uh you know uh the novelist michael shaban um, had sort of co-developed it with akiva goldsman in the first season and was sort of the the vision and the showrunner for the show and then into season two they had brought terry metallis who was my showrunner for 12 monkeys in Mm -hmm. harry had brought me and because of sort of crazy pandemic pandemonium rather than terry taking the reins completely in season two it was sort of split between him and akiva Okay, And so, you know, Terry didn't really get the keys to the car until season three. And season three, I think, is really the season that we feel, I think all the writers really feel that we were allowed to do the kind of Star Trek we signed up to do uh, and really tell the story that we were longing to tell. And and I think we did it really well. And so it's been, uh, I'm very proud of what we did and what our team accomplished. And, and I think folks have received it really well it, it was it, it's been really embraced popularly critically you know the fans seem to have loved it you know i feel like we, we we kind of checked all the boxes and took the right path with that season what was interesting was it started to air kind of concurrently with all of the strike talk you know oh, and okay. so it was very strange that on like the one half of your brain you have all this anxiety about 
oh my God, am I not going to work? How long is this going to go? Uh, you know, how am I going to pay my bills? Right. Yeah, of course. And, and on the other half, it's like praise, constant praise from the internet being like, we love this. This is great. Week after week. You're like, this episode's better than the last episode. And and people calling you up and be like, do my podcast. And, and so there's this weird feeling of like getting all of these rewards that you hope for as a writer at the worst possible <laughs> time. Well, when you... But you can't put them to use, you know, like there's no <laughs> show to springboard to right now. There's I can't leverage this into, you know, selling my own thing or, or, or right. going to work for some show I dreamed of working for. Um, well, so, that's very entrepreneurial of you to think, you know, I, I need to leverage success. That's a big thing in Hollywood. But at the same time, given there's a strike, there's a lot of folks that don't have that reinforcement of their work yes, no, it, every day. And um, that must be, you know, a, a nice little buffer against, right. you know, the reality of a, of a strike. Is are, are people jonesing for a season four? Is that a possibility or no? I think they there's a big... And just to be clear, it's not so much leveraging. It's wanting to continue doing the thing that we love doing to tell stories. And, you know, like, I think we've never been, and this is sort of an answer to the question you just asked, like coming off of season three, there's been real fan fervor for um, Terry had sort of, sort of um, in, in the press sort of pitched what his vision of, of how that show could go forward, you know, sort of sans Patrick, you know, mm -hmm. into a, a series that he had sort of, kind of called just in his own head Star Trek Legacy. And the fans really picked up on it and really started demanding it. And really there was a, there's a, a big call. There's a petition. Um, there's a lot of online momentum uh, for, to, to make that show a reality. And we've never been in a position where we're sort of more poised to springboard into something like that and to convince Paramount and CBS that that should be the next Star War, um, Star Trek uh, adventure. Um, and yet we just can't, we just can't, you know, well, all the writers are hungry to get back in the room and tell more stories in this universe with these characters. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, it, everything's on pause right now. So all that uncertainty of when it's going to be resolved. And then have you lost that momentum from the fans, um, to use their enthusiasm to hopefully convince the Paramount to, yeah. to move forward. And if Terry and you guys have a good take on it you know fingers crossed that uh it'll work out I think, I think we can get there i hope um I'm, I'm hopeful and if not you know that you know this will resolve itself there will be other shows and entertainment is not going away this is a conflict it's a fight worth fighting you know yeah. and i and i and i think that you know the the strike is very interesting because there are you know there are a number of tiers of of writers there are you know, writers who are new to the industry, who are just coming in, who've just gotten their cards, who mm -hmm. are pre-WGA, uh, or writers who have worked, say, for for quite a while, but are not, they're not paying all of their bills off right. of uh, WGA credits. They're not staffed on shows. Um, then you have a sort of middle, sort of middle, middle class, middle tier of writer who, like, they are, they go from show to show, they go from room to room. Uh, they're developing, you know, they don't have other jobs. Like this is how, and I'm one of them. This is how we pay right. our bills. This is how we pay our mortgages. And so, and then you have a whole upper tier of writers, the 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 Ryan Murphys and the JJs and the 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 super producers, and even just the very hyper successful showrunners who have overall deals or have had incredibly successful shows who can financially weather a six month, eight month mm -hmm. strike way that that other writers can't and so you know i think it's it's rare when you can get all three of those tiers who have varying degrees of senses of urgency to agree that you know this is a fight that we have to win and we have to um stick it out no matter how much it sort of pains us to do that and you know i think we're 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 doing it so. yeah it seems like um you know the middle is holding which yeah. is going to be important. Well, uh, I know one of the issues is um, staffing and what the writers' yeah. room look like. I'm, I'm curious from Twelve Monkeys to Nine One One to Picard, on that topic of staffed rooms. How would you describe each one of those shows in terms of how many writers were are on staff versus what the what the arguments are now about? Uh, about this strike, which is making sure that there's, you know, uh, staff writers that are learning their craft and m yeah. moving the show forward. I mean, I'm of several minds about it. I I, I do. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work on shows, whether it was 12 Monkeys, 911 or Picard, where we had 
anywhere between like eight to 12 writers in the room at any given time. Wow. That's a we, lot, right? You know, we, we, we were really blessed to have like, you know, full rooms certain seasons, but we never really had an empty room. You know, we never like sat around the table and there was only three people. Right. Mm -hmm. So all the shows that I've worked on really benefited from all of those voices creatively. You know, there was always someone, and I've always said this in interviews, the Terra Metalis, especially in 12 Monkeys and Picard, really has a talent for his sort of overarching skill, I think, is he he knows how to conduct the orchestra, he knows how to uh, staff a room of writers, each with unique strengths, and then knows how to get them to play off of each other so that there'll be certain writers who are better at the comedy. There'll be certain writers who are really good at the big sci-fi 35,000 foot ideas. There are other writers who are dialogue people. And We'll all write and rewrite each other's scripts and it'll be better for everybody's contributions. And so, you know, whereas something like 911, for example, is a little bit more like you're signed an episode, you get an episode, you write the episode, the episode goes goes out, you know, and then gets... Does, when please, you say it goes out, does it go out to the showrunner and the showrunner polishes it? Yeah, and the showrunner polishes it and then production tells you what's too expensive, what's not right. expensive. It's, mm -hmm. it's less of a sort of like symphonic collaboration mm -hmm. of, of voices because it's a little bit more just episodic and structural and case of the week. And so that was a really unique uh, experience as well. But in, in all of those experiences you had the benefit of eight, 10, 12 different minds sitting around a table, pitching ideas um, that all complemented each other and ultimately made the work stronger or made the episodes more interesting. Now, I do totally support the idea of individual auteur writer-directors who have a story to tell that they feel can only be told in their unique voice you know i mean you look at aaron sorkin you look at noah hawley you know you look at these stephen knight you know yeah who who have very unique specific voices and visions and i feel you know that there needs to be room in the conversation for singular auteur creators to be able to create but i do think that to protect the vast majority of shows that really do uh benefit from the collaboration of voices you know, there should be a minimum room number so that that the, that ultimately the producers can't uh, reduce what we do to a, a UK model, you know, where scripts are freelance and right. you can't ultimately pay your bills. Like being a writer doesn't necessarily mean you have any degree of financial success or stability. So, um, you know, if Taylor Sheridan has to put up with, uh, you know, a room of three writers sitting around, he's free not to use them. He's free to write every script. He's free to use them for research, to pop in every now and then and ask for an idea. Uh, and otherwise, let's just subsidize them showing up to work and eating snacks and leaving at night. But I do think, you know, that that there does need to be a minimum room size to support what we're doing in the long term. And I think the the amount of shows that have those sort of singular visions are so few and far between compared to the vast majority of the rest of the industry, that this is a fight worth, a hill worth dying on. But also, isn't it the uh, the idea of these mini rooms that they've yeah. been putting together where they're not officially a show right. that's moving forward and yet you're doing the same work that you would have been, you'd be doing if it was green lit. Um, so that seems to be a major problem. Yeah. We need to get more clarity and definition on, you know, what constitutes a room, the length of the room, the population of that room, because right now, you know, I think many rooms started as, you know, potentially an interesting idea, you know, right. Like before we green light this thing and bring in 10 people to sit around a table you know, the showrunner wants to bring in, you know, two, three, uh, you know, of, of his or her closest collaborators, yeah, uh, collaborators and kind of talk and kick around and really figure out what the thing is before we dive into it. And, you know, that I think on principle is, you know, unique and interesting. But the problem is that model started to get all of a sudden it was, OK, well, if you think you can get most of it done with three people in 10 weeks, why are we going to give you 10 people and 20 weeks? And so the burden falls on too few writers um, who then aren't allowed to go to sets, who aren't allowed to amass that experience and right. learn how to produce. And, and, you know, ultimately I do think, you know, I have this sort of theory. I don't think it's so much a theory that's unique to me, but I certainly ascribe to it, which is, you know, all of, all of this conflict, you know, and, and, and so much of what we're talking about stems from, I think, a lack of smart, creative producing in Hollywood today, which is to say that, like, I think when streaming became a thing 
10, 15 years ago when it was a, when it was sort of a kernel of an idea. The, the thought was always, well, let's take the mid-budget movie. Let's take the 50 to 75, $90 million movie and amortize that across 10 episodes versus two hours. We'll dig into the character. We'll tell more story. I don't think, you know, necessarily this level of let's spend a billion dollars on the Lord of the Rings IP right. was, was really the, the first initial thought of that. And when you're making these big spends that really butt up against and equate to what you'd spend on a theatrical mega budget summer blockbuster, you can't possibly recoup your costs like that. And so, you know, I think where, where we at, we're, we're at a point where shows really are spending so much money that they don't have to spend. And, you know, I, I look back at my time on 12 monkeys where I, I, I went up to Toronto and I lived in Toronto for 18 months and produced seasons three and four back to back with Tara Metalis and a handful of other writers and it is a unique and rare experience. And we produced a time travel show where the protagonists were going to different times every week <laughs> that often looped back on each other. And, you know, there'd be something in this episode that didn't pay off for 10 episodes. And, and at, at the end of which we crashed a time traveling city into another time traveling city. And we had spectacle and we had production value and we did it for $2.7 million an episode. Because we were really smart about how we produce, because we understood right. how to when to go abroad to get the bang for your buck, how to cross board episodes, how to you know work with actors and to work with each department to get the most bang for the most buck. And that is not something that we would have been able to do if we didn't have writers who were emboldened and taught and instructed and had the experience of learning how to keep those costs down so that we didn't have to do it for 5 million, 7 million, 10 million an episode. We could do it effectively for all, less than three. We we'll empower writers to learn their trade and to become good at that aspect of, of this industry. The more you can keep budgets down, the more that we can keep studios from having to freak out about their bottom lines and to take content off platforms and uh, the more we can keep writers uh, working and the more shows we can produce for the same amount of money. Well, it's sensible, except that the notion um, that of streaming coming in was that they were going to buy their way into the market. So in the same way, Amazon sold books and lost money, but took a right. big piece of that business, you know, when Netflix came along and spent a lot of money on House of Cards and had David Fincher and produced a, you know, a great show, uh, right. you know, they bought their way to the top echelon of, uh, of Hollywood and they continued to spend and spend and spend and everybody jumped on. And, and then as of course, it's the market's been saturated. So now you have to think of along the lines of what you just said, what's right. going to be, um, you know, desirable is, I would think, from a studio standpoint, is finding folks like you and that team that did 12 Monkeys and trying to produce shows um, for a more reasonable cost, broader storytelling, and hiring more, uh, empowering more writers, as you said. I also think there's an in interesting thing going on from an audience perspective, too, and you're seeing it with box office reception to... Uh, the Flash, or to even Indiana Jones, for example, this week. I think because spectacle is so available now on every platform. Like, you know, spectacle is not just like the arena of the movie theater. You know, you can go see a billion dollar Lord of the Rings fight sequence on TV. You can see it in your theater. And all of these big budget sort of blockbuster IP driven uh, stories all have this sort of like the the stakes are the end of the world, the destruction of the universe, the collapse of the multiverse. And I think w there's no respite from these sort of like artificially ridiculously high stakes that you can never top, right? There's nothing more dire than the fate of the universe. And so I think you're going to see it, it's never been more important for writers to get in there and and sort of say, Look, you don't have to do a $250 million Avengers movie where the fate of the world hangs in the balance again. Maybe you can do 
three $100 million Avengers movies where the stakes are more emotional, more personal, but the concept is still really high. Like what's Ocean's Eleven with the Avengers, right? What's, you know, you can find all of these touchstones to make movies that still have all the stuff in them that audience love, but are more creative about what the story is, what the hook is, what the emotion is, what the themes are. And you can make them cost less too. And then the audience will feel, oh, I haven't seen this in the eight other things I just watched now. You know, like I look at Marvel and really the show, the one Marvel show I really responded to the most, and this isn't a criticism of any of the shows on their on their own, but like I really liked She-Hulk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really liked She-Hulk because the stakes weren't like, oh my God. End what's of the world, going- yeah. It was really just, is she going to find happiness is she going to find contentment how is she going to navigate this strange unique thing that has happened and how could she do that and keep herself and her family and her friends together and it was written cleverly and warmly and it probably didn't cost 300 million dollars to make and i found it really refreshing and really uh, original and so i feel like the more you need writers more than ever to tell you how to take all the great ingredients that IP gives you and execute it at a high concept level at high quality for less money and push back against, I think, a certain level of not superhero fatigue or IP fatigue or blockbuster fatigue, but stakes fatigue. Like yeah. we're all, we're telling the same story over and over again. And so I think that's I what think I'm people, I think people are, they're not fresh enough. People are they're looking right. for you know, a fresh take on it. I I remember when the Joker came out and it was so dark and so interesting and I I had no expectation that it would be so successful. Um, But the great thing about television is, you know, there's so many options. I I saw on Twitter, you mentioned um, Drops of God. And Mm -hmm. uh, I've been watching Drops of God along with Hijack on uh, Apple. And that's a really unique interesting story uh, yeah. framed in a way that I never would have expected a story about wine and vineyards to be framed. I loved it. And it's so, it's such a, a beautiful, unique, and it and it's the perfect sort of like way to lean into this thing that streamers are, are looking for now, which is, you know, we want to make one thing that can sort of serve a bunch of audiences. Exactly. And it, it figured out a way to tell a French story and a and a and a Japanese story in an American way that sort of allowed any of those audiences to plug into it and yet was emotional and visually interesting uh and not and not as boring at all as you think as <laughs> as you might think if you just read the log line. Yeah, right? Exactly. And it's it's one of my favorite shows this year by a mile. Uh, yeah. because Good writers figured out how to execute it well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a it's a great example of people, writers having a voice that's unique that AI could never you know, could never replicate. Yeah. Also that idea of the multicultural. Uh they have the same thing going on in hijack, which is a pretty uh yeah. pretty exciting um we've started watching that yeah, now show as well. So And look, I mean that that show right there is a great like we're gonna amortize one set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna build one set. We're gonna spend our money on that, and then we're gonna tell a story. You know, I don't know how it's gonna unfold. I think only the first four have come out. Like, but you know, we're gonna tell a what eight episode, ten episode story, and like that's fairly financially responsible way to try to make television. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you can execute that at its highest level, you know, I don't think audiences will find themselves asking for. You know, I wish there was a hundred mil- million dollars on screen. I think they'll just be captivated with what they're watching. Yeah, it's very suspenseful and uh, we have great characters. And one of the things that television does so well and that, you know, films are struggling with. Uh, I'm right. I'm really excited about seeing um, Christopher Nolan's new movie. Uh, oh, Oppenheimer. yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, I'm excited to go to the theater to see that movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and I haven't, I don't go to the theater that much. You know, and I then walk it. down the hall and see Barbie right after. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which looks like a hoot. So, it did. Um, well, you hey, uh, you know, a lot of my uh, listeners are uh, are creatives and uh, and uh, readers and writers, and um, you know, it's interesting your story and your trajectory, your career trajectory, starting off as a journalist. Uh, I believe it was for was IGN your first uh, was your first gig or. 
Yeah, it, it was all sort of a, you know, so my, my first gig where I really started my career was in uh, marketing. So, you know, I, I began my career in PR and marketing and I was, you know, I always was a nerd growing up. And um, my first really gig in that in that universe was um, was working for Microsoft and Xbox, um, launching the Xbox 360. OK, wait, before you go there, you said I was a nerd. So when you say you were into a, a nerd and you were into all things pop culture, kind of. And did you were you taking that? the things you were interested in saying, how am I going to figure out how to work at a cool company that does yes. games or that's, that was your out of college or what was yeah, the, so, what were you thinking? And what was your game plan? Like for those people so, that are coming out of college and thinking about being in the, in the business, you need a, you need a first, a first step. What was your okay, strategy? So, you know, I always knew growing up, I love reading. I love writing. I love video games. I love books. I, I was a big genre nerd my whole life. And when I got to college, you're sitting there and you're doing your sort of liberal arts education thing. And you're like, how do I create an inroad right into uh -huh. that? And, you know, what I found was, and, and everyone's experience will be different, but I wasn't learning. There's really like no college course you can like take to learn how to like be a writer, right? Like, like read and watch movies and right. just mm -hmm. do it, right? And if you have a, an inherent, you, you can learn structure, you know, you can read a book and learn structure and you can be taught that, I suppose. But like, if you've got the skill and the love and the passion, like it will come out of you and you will write things. And so, you know, I was finding, and, and that that's very different for technicians, you know, like you do need classes to learn how to be a DP or a director. Yes, you know, yes, things. I think but, uh, people understand. Um, but, uh, you know, but for me, it was, you know, I realized... You know, look, I'm going to Fordham University in, in New York, which doesn't have like a phenomenally strong film program. They have a good communications program, good general communications program, they had decent screenwriting classes. Um, but I was never, that was never going to tip the scales. That was never going to make the difference for me. And what I started doing while I was there, because I was poor and I didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have any money, but I still wanted to play video games and listen to music and <laughs> read comic books. And you're going to find a way. I am so, going to find a way. <laughs> so I, I I I started writing for the school paper and I realized, oh, I can call companies and ask for review products <laughs> and, uh, and they'll send it to me for free. Wow. So I really embraced this idea of, um, you know, uh, journalism as a way to kind of get paid to consume and do all the things I love doing anyway and write and, and exercise one of the things that I loved doing. And so... The second strategy that when I was going to college, I figured out was I'm going to get more value from internships than from the actual classes. And so I started interning for a lot of the same people I was asking for stuff from. So, uh, you know, I called Fox and said, look, I know I call you a couple of times a week asking for screening invites or whatever to review for the paper. Do you have an internship program there I can come and do? And so I went and I internship, interned for Fox's marketing department and their PR department. Then I went to Sony, then I went to DreamWorks. And I, I, I tried to learn as much about the industry as I could and make as many contacts as I could. And so when I got out of college, I was equipped to go do marketing and PR, which wasn't necessarily my dream. I wanted to write, I wanted to be a writer, but it was adjacent to the things that I cared about. I could go work for Microsoft and I could go uh, help them develop a PR plan and a marketing plan for the Xbox 360. I could play video games. I could be around that world. I could learn about it. And after a couple of years, eventually the journalists I was working with every day said, hey, you can make more money over with us playing the video games and watching the movies and critiquing them than you can shilling for them on a PR site. Mm -hmm. and okay. So said, okay. Well, that's, there you go. There's the next step. I'm going to move from there to there. And I've always said to anybody who asked me, because there is no map yeah. success in this business, that the most you can do is put yourself where lightning can strike and then kind of hope that it does cover yourself in as much tinfoil as you can and then hope <laughs> that it happens. And, and that's really what the early years of my career were, were trying to do was, was, trying to figure out how to go from college to that one job, from that job to another job that was a little bit more closer to what I want to do. And then while I was at IGN, 
I was able to make all these great friendships and relationships with folks in the industry, you know, with producers and actors that all five years later paid off with my first staffing gig. You know, it, there, there wasn't really like a grand master plan. It was a selfish desire to get paid to be the thing that I had been my whole life, which was just a genre nerd. And how, how were those internships? Were you able to, <clears throat> did they pay you or did they give you enough um, creative license to participate that you were getting the juice from that? Or? No, I mean, they were all basic internships. They were all unpaid. The college only asked you to do one, but I did three just mm. to learn and grow and, and make those relationships. And I liked doing them, um, you know, but it's like, my first, my first job as an intern was, I, they, they don't do this anymore because it's a, we live in a digital world. But like, I used to have to go to the office every day and we had like a hundred papers of newspaper subscriptions. And I would have to go to the entertainment section of each paper, each paper, look to see if there was an article about something that our company had done, physically cut it out, <laughs> put it on a piece of paper, photocopy it, <laughs> then make you know, put a book together, make a hundred copies of that book and distribute it to everyone. <laughs> so they could see, you know, okay, are we doing well? Are we not doing well? That was before computers and digital ways yeah. to measure your metrics and all that stuff. And, you know, that wasn't a particularly rewarding job, but, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but what it got me was I became very close with my boss. Um, it was a, it was a publicist at the time named Neil Platt who worked for uh, who worked for Fox. And anytime there was a meeting I could sit in, anytime there was something he could teach me, you know, lesson by lesson, I'd learn a little more. I'd meet someone else and I'd, you know, I'd learn more about the business. And over three of those internships, I came out with a pretty complex understanding of how this all works. Mm. Um, uh, and and those relationships really are the thing that platform you and platform you and platform you. Yeah, and as as those relationships, as everybody moves their, their way up, you know, somebody yeah. usually brings you along my story that's similar but quite different is um you know meeting ed dector and john strauss in a shakespeare class at ucla and talking story and talking about there's something about mary something they were working on and reading that right. and then you know five years later they brought up the script nothing had happened and boom suddenly I and mean, i had a relationship with the fairly brothers and Suddenly, the project is moving forward. Right. I think it, it definitely it definitely works that way. But putting yourself out there and having stories to tell, um, because you were you were also doing journalism, but writing reviews yeah. and talking to people. But you also you know wrote a novel, as I remember. I think it was called um, Nightbreed, right? Oh, so, uh, well, short story. So there was a, I had been. It was, was it going to be part of a novel, uh, a book series, right? Yeah. So the idea was when I was at IGN, you know, I had a lot of opportunities to meet celebrities, interview them, et cetera. But, you know, very few opportunities to like meet your heroes. And I got to meet Clive Barker, who had always been a hero of mine as a kid. Uh, I loved his books, him, Stephen King. And so Clive, I was doing an interview with him. And, you know, we were just talking about, you know, my upbringing and my love of his work. And, and he goes, he goes, I don't think you're a journalist. He's like, I think you're a screenwriter. He's like, I think you're a writer. And, and he goes, just pick something of mine. Do you want to adapt it? I'll give you the rights. So he mentored me, took me under his wing. I did two movies for his production company. Uh, never made a ton of money, but it was, they were, they were great opportunities to get my start, uh, to take the sort of like pilots I'd been writing for myself and really level them up to the next level. And uh, through him, you know, I got to do, it was a Hellraiser uh, graphic novel that was eight issues long and this Nightbreed story um, that was the, one of the centerpiece stories at the heart of this collection uh, that they were doing. A bunch of great authors were contributing the sort of no, um, short stories and novellas to this um, collection of sort of separate stories based on his Nightbreed universe. Uh, and I got to do that. And and that was a joy. And, uh, you know, I, it was really, he was the first sort of major personality with cred and a reputation in the industry to take me under his wing and see the potential and, and try to nurture it. And wait, it wait, 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 what year was that? 
this was 2008, nine, something like that, probably. Wow. I, 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 we have to go back and look because I remember you wrote uh, an episode of Hatter Madigan for me, and it was yes. right around 2008, 2009. Now, okay. I'm not Clive Barker, but maybe which one of us started with uh, <laughs> saying that uh, we wanted you to write something in our world. I, I remember it happening right at the same time because I think yeah. we were having coffee and and I uh, you had pitched me this story of Hatter in the Wild West uh, in Death Valley. Um, and then I remember you working with Clive so, yeah. so I, um, but yeah. I, you know, I get it. You, you, you come across as the kind of person that has a lot of story engine inside of them. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I want to ask you something, I'm going to, uh, just because I mentioned story engine and you were talking about writers in a room, yeah. where would you, how you described people are good with dialogue. People are good from, you know, 30,000 feet. How do you see yourself in terms of, as a writer, your strengths? It's, you know, it's interesting because I, I very much, I'm unique in the sense that, uh, I should, I'm not special. I, I just mean my, my, my story is unique in the sense that I grew up loving video games, comic books, all the nerd stuff that, you know, a lot of really uh, uh, terrific genre writers um, grew up with. But my, uh, my uncle uh, was a, he was a theater guy. He loved the theater. And so he would introduce me uh, in my high school years to, you know, like Sam Shepard and, uh, you know, um, David Mamet and all of these really, you know, super specific Arthur Miller, like with with sharp dialogue and like really just so I became uh, as, as much as I was a fan of, of genre, I was a fan of. I was a fan of really finely honed character driven dialogue mm -hmm. and it wasn't until later in my adolescence. And, and I, I was fortunate enough to sort of, to sort of be a teenager in, in the Miramax years, right. The rise of the independent movie where mm -hmm. all these amazing writers like Quentin Tarantino, Soderbergh, you know, with really hyper-specific voices were being allowed to make these really interesting films. And then all of a sudden you have someone like, you know, and I know that circumstances have made the name a little passe at this point, but like Joss Whedon, right, came along at the time yeah, with and said, hey, you can take all this really sharp, stylized, amazing dialogue and apply it to genre storytelling. Mm -hmm. And these people can be talking as cleverly as someone in a David Mamet play or an Aaron Sorkin drama, you know, can talk. And so I like to think that sort of where I bring value to a room is those sort of like big swing 35,000 foot sci-fi concepts and ideas. But then also more granularly down here, like a great scene, like, you know, with, with really crackly dialogue and really, you know, sharp character work, you know, I'll never be, I'll never write a broad comedy. I'm just like, I'm not funny. And, you know, uh, we, we had a writer on Picard, Cindy, who was tremendously funny and will just be, what she does, I can never do. And I'm in awe of that kind of talent. Right. So I like really big swing conceptual stuff, but then I like really getting under the hood and doing like a great dramatic scene with some clever, twisty wordplay dialogue. Dialogue writers were, were really my biggest influence in in film and TV coming up. Yeah, when I was uh, when I was uh, studying acting, I studied for a short time under Stella Adler. And one of the things that she required was for you to study the uh, playwrights, the, you know, the David Mamets and understand where they were coming from. So you could, you know, really grasp the, the work. And I felt the same way. I, I think I learned more from playwrights and the economy of storytelling and the, the, the necessity for great dialogue to make things work. And of course, that's the most satisfying as an actor. But oh, I was really fascinated with their backstory and the reason they became writers and how these plays came about. And that was more influential, I think, in a lot of ways to, uh, to me writing The Looking Glass Wars than... You know, I think my favorite uh, favorite book growing up was the uh, Phantom Toll Booth. Oh, um, I love that book. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, so whimsical and um, 
not dissimilar to uh, to Alice in Wonderland. So the right. connection is not um, is not very well, far. Well, it was apart. always you know even books like Alice, you know, because you know when I grew up, so much of what I grew up reading was prose, and then eventually became plays and, and movies and I consumed those. No one will ever accuse me of writing a scene with naturalistic dialogue. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I know I know a lot of writers and there's no right or wrong here. I, I know a lot of writers who really approach a scene and they're like, I want my characters to talk the way people really speak. And I just like, I, I'm in 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Like, you know, I, I, I love words and I want my characters to use those words as best as they possibly can and in the most inventive combinations of ways, you know? So I look at shows like Succession and I'm just in awe of the, the way that they'll take a simple idea and, and wrap it in the most, the bacon of this incredible verbiage. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, whether, or Stephen Moffat on um, Doctor Who, who just has this amazing crackerjack, very twee kind of dialogue or Amy Sherman Palladino who has this, machine gun um rat -tat, tat of words uh you know sorkin all that stuff i really love the mechanics of constructing a sentence with word plays and rhythms and mm -hmm. uh in, in a way that other writers don't find value in because you know for them it's about how do i make the scene as human as possible as relatable as possible i want people to talk exactly how people talk in real life and for me you know, I go to, you know, if I go to the theater and I see a truck turn into a robot, I wonder, well, what's the dialogue equivalent of that? You know, <laughs> I want to go see entertainment in a way that uh, I don't experience in real life. I want to see people talk at a level I wish I could talk at or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's kind of my jumble of influences. Well, I noticed that with the story that you wrote for me, uh, I you know, we kind of pitched me this idea. And the first thing that I read was the interior dialogue that Hatter was, uh, was going through. And that's how the story opens. And I thought you were able to get into his head and be very poetic at the same time, and then set the story up and the stage for, you know, sort of a classic villains who underestimate are exceedingly right talented and deadly character who looks, <laughs> who is the other. And it was uh, very poetic uh, and not all that realistic, the dialogue at the end, but gr because, you know, they underestimated this guy with the hat. And right. I think there was a line, he something about, you know, you have a uh, a, a six shooter and and uh, the bad guy said, because he wanted to draw on him, he goes, yeah, it's under my hat. And... <laughs> <laughs> I always, I mean, I remember when you first introduced me to, to your world, Hatter was the character that I plugged into immediately, you know, because I think at the time and, and just as much since, I'm so deeply influenced and I, I'm i such a Doctor Who fan. Mm -hmm. And Grant Hatter and, and Doctor Who are nothing alike. Um, but they are these sort of lone heroes unstuck in time. And, and they have the flexibility to find themselves, you know, moving through their narratives in these nonlinear ways. And there's something I've just always liked about those kinds of stories, you know, whether it's Sam Beckett and Quantum Leap or whether it's, you know, Doctor Who or whatever, that, that these are people who want these characters who, who want, in, in a weird way, what everybody experiences. I just want to go from point A point B to get the thing that I'm after and I'm looking for and I so desperately want but because of the way my life is structured I can't get there that way and there's something so you know sort of beautiful and lonely and interesting whether the character is as sort of like serious and action focused and sort of gravely as Hatter or as whimsical as say Doctor Who I, I've always loved those kinds of stories so I plugged into Hatter immediately when you introduced me to your your world well, what's what what I find interesting about you know the those two shows you mentioned. I mean, obviously there's Twelve Monkeys as well. Um, yeah. So these time travel shows, Doctor Who has been around and spectacular, Quantum Leap the same. I was quite rigid in the story structure uh, with Hatter, and I to not in terms of dialogue, but in terms of following historical events so that it would feel like the audience could really suspend disbelief in terms of the notion that right. this was a real place. But in exploring 
television and exploring the idea of doing this as an ongoing show, conversations I think I've had with you and other people was, oh, well, why doesn't, if Hatter can go through a, a portal to our world in 1871, why shouldn't you have him time jump and start to create that fish out of water in all sorts of times and right. have that contemporary lens. I think it's a I think it's a really, you know, interesting way of telling maybe getting into the looking glass wars through Hatter, through his time in our world. I you know, I just haven't quite been brave enough to uh to to <laughs> to pull the trigger uh on that because I I keep, you know, I I keep thinking, okay, well, where's Alice in this? And would I be cutting back to Alice? Or would I just simply right. would I just simply leave her until this series runs its course, three, four epi- uh, seasons, and then introduce and introduce um Alice and then expand it. Well you've 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 inadvertently you've inadvertently no quite purposefully rather created a world in, that there's ten ways into. You know what I mean? And it's you you could choose any of those and they would be wildly successful approaches. Uh, I don't know if they'd be wildly successful, uh, but maybe <laughs> if you help me out, they would be. I'm exploring that. And I think, you know, you and I uh, work together when we put together that m- mini room um, right. to to explore the structure. At the time, the uh, Queen's Gamut hadn't come out. Um uh, and I thought that was a really interesting way of starting the show where you just have a you know cold open of the the adult al- I mean the adult character and then you take the full episode, the first episode and uh, give the origin story. But uh, I still I still think that most people with the looking glass wars hook into Hatter. He's the most popular character. Well Hatter's in some ways he's the wish fulfillment, right? I yeah. mean like he's we all wish we could be as cool as as that character and uh as composed and as strong and stalwart and you know um you know that i think that's why the the relationship between someone like hatter and alice you know i mean or at least alice in the sort of traditional sense of the original books i always you know i always loved because you know she's so driven by a sense of curiosity and discovery and i think we all are you know i mean we all in our in our own sort of unique lives kind of come to a rabbit hole and wonder what's down there and it's are we brave enough to are we brave enough to jump or not i think curiosity especially for writers is the best quality you can have the most important quality you can have is to wonder you know why and to wonder what um and then to go chase those things and experience them and then manifest those things in your own work and so you know i think what you've done in 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 your fiction is to expand upon that so you have these two central characters who are you know one really is about curiosity and discovery and then the other is very much about loyalty you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like you know he is he is on this mission and he is on this uh you know he is experiencing this this other world but it is it is almost with a singular purpose to move through it to get back to where he's from you know he's not interested in necessarily shedding that purpose to discover and consume and learn he just wants to sort of blaze through the world and i think that there's a little bit of all those characters and everybody i mean i think though the the, uh, the wish fulfillment and um blazing ahead uh in terms of doing a series uh would probably get a bit old if he wasn't <laughs> able to you know really start to have interior difficult problems that he's not succeeding, that he's failing, and how that affects his search and his personality and these obstacles that he comes across. You brought up the word curious. And as you know, in my book series, I always use, I use imagination. What do you think the influence of curiosity versus imagination to ultimately create something? I mean, I think imagination is just an extension of of curiosity, right? Like, you know, curiosity is standing is standing in front of the rabbit hole, and imagination is picturing what might be down there, and then the reality is whatever you'll discover when you jump. And and I think anybody can imagine anything. You can sit in a room and you can give yourself a scenario, and you can imagine, oh, what would this be like? What would that world be like? What would it be like if? I think curiosity is a little bit more about 
empathy. You know, I can sit in my office and imagine what, you know, a science fiction universe might be. And, uh, you know, I can imagine, okay, I'm going to write a story. It's going to be set on a space station. I I wonder what that space station would look like. I wonder what people would be on that. I think curiosity is about coming up to something in your life that's real and tangible uh, that you don't know and that you're unaccustomed to and wondering enough about it to experience it and cross over into it and explore it and ask why and talk to the people and learn. And and I think when you couple those things, when you couple a sense of real empathy for, you know, what is out there in the world that I don't know that I could discover that would be interesting, that would better me, change me, and then applying imagination to that, you know, so I can go, I can say, for example, this is, I, I have, I've more traveled than this, but maybe you've never been to Europe before and you're curious about it and you want to break out of your sort of American view of the world. And so you get your passport and you go to Europe and you taste the Netherlands and you see Paris and you see Italy and, uh, you know, you, you experience all these wonderful cultures and foods and blah, blah, blah. And then imagination is taking that experience and saying, okay, what if that happened in a fantasy world? What if that happened in a sci-fi world? And you're able to write those stories better because you've empathetically as a human being shared that same degree of experience in your own set of contexts and lives. So I think they're inseparable in some ways. And there's levels and it's research, curiosity, immersing yourself in whatever that is thing that you're interested in, and then trying to imagine what you're going to create and then working on creating that. It's all part of this zone that we like to get into where you're hopefully the flow of creativity uh, after those two are inseparable come together and give you some inspiration. Um, And I think there are some, there are some writers who can do both. And there are some writers who, who've really made wonderful careers out of doing, you know, one, Um, you know, and, and, you know, certain writers have their things. Carl Hyacin will always write books about Florida. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he he knows one thing and he's going to drill down, 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 down until he's explored every nook and crevice of the one thing that he knows well. And other writers will say, well, I want to experience the world and I'll go write that. And both are fine because they're driven by a curiosity to understand either many new things or better understand the one thing that, you know, that you find yourself most sort of either located in or accustomed to or around. It takes curiosity and imagination to tell the smallest, most granular story as it does to the, tell the biggest, the wildest, story. most fanciful. So, so uh, were you introduced to Alice in Wonderland through the novel or the Disney movie or something else? Through the books. When I was growing up, my grandfather always uh, really encouraged me to read. And so he would... I remember he he would go to yard sales, tag sales, all these things. And, you know, for like a quarter at a time, like people would just throw books out on their tables. And, you know, uh, and so he'd come back, you know, once a week during the spring and summer with like a paper bag full of like books that he would just found for me. And a lot of those books were older, you know, books. They were, you know, old Doc Savage novels. Right. Which like a kid my age, they they those novels still predated me by 20, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was reading like John Carter of Mars and old Doc Savage books and, you know, pulp things that he would pull from from these tag sales at a, at a pretty young age. And, you know, I, I think eventually he brought home like a, a really beautiful hardcover um, version of uh, Alice in Wonderland, which I, wow. I, I, which I remember reading. You know, I can't remember exactly what age it was, but I remember being really formative for me in the sense of it it's a you know it's not a not trippy story <laughs> uh, and and, uh, yeah. and and i really i really enjoyed it and then i think the animated versions came after that so it was my experience of alice was unique in the sense that my first visual of it were whatever i made up in my head oh, i didn't that's the I best way cobbling, i wasn't cobbling it together from cultural reference points right which yeah. most of us are doing now because it's so deeply seated in culture. So right. have you seen it uh, much in television? I, I see images of Alice popping up. I think in Stranger Things, I, there was a, like the picture behind me. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. Alice and 
Uh, it's a little it? um uh, it's gotten to a point now where you're like yeah okay we, we get it yeah yeah, yeah. You know, i think in star the trek there's a there's a there's a, a a copy of somebody's reading the book no. oh yeah. yeah i mean it's yeah. it's it's simultaneously a staple but it's like if i hear white rabbit as the soundtrack to a given scene ever again <laughs> like i get it guys they, you know we're it, it's sort of one of those because that you know because alice is in 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 it is a universal story in the sense that every story of whether it's Star Trek or Lord of the Rings or whatever is about is the, it's the hero's journey of fundamentally we're leaving home. We're going to a strange place where we're going to find out things about ourselves. And, you know, uh, that change in us will allow us to uh, complete our journey and, and hopefully come home. And so I think, you know, you know, in a lot of ways, like that, that sort of structure of storytelling whether it's star trek whether it's you know lord of the rings whatever you know game of thrones whatever yeah. like it, it shares an inherent dna with 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 alice so you know it, it makes sense that it pops up everywhere as the sort of grandfather of yeah. that kind of storytelling do you have a favorite um whether it's a you know a, a song or a or a movie or uh, any a piece of art of alice that resonated with you uh along the way this is probably a game you reviewed a lot you yeah, must the, have reviewed the, a bunch of games the the mcgee alice games uh -huh. um really because i like horror a lot and it was great to see a kind of someone step in and say we're going to do a kind of darker horror driven take of these things i i liked that game quite a bit and, and there's been talk ever since it came out about potentially there being another one and so it kind of it's refreshed in in my gaming zeitgeist every couple of years and i just remember that making an impression upon me in terms of like one of the first adaptations of that material that i thought was really interesting and cool and visual and unique and and spun it in a way uh that it wasn't just telling the same story it was telling it was it was telling a different story from a different point of view, which I liked a lot. So it tickled a lot of my yeah my boxes. Yeah, and he also he created almost a subgenre of the dark Alice stories. Yeah, um, because yeah. after well, that, Todd McFarlane, you know, let now let's do dark Dorothy. Now let's yes, do dark, exactly. let's let's take a clean cut American fairy tale and do the grim version of it, which can either be cool or a little cringy, depending on your approach. And, and and I'm I'm of the opinion that I think the best adaptation of Alice in Wonderland is yet to be made. I go back through all the various ones that I've seen, and, and I don't think I love any of them. Mm -hmm. Like the Dis the most recent Disney one, you know, whether it's the the, the you know, Johnny Depp one or with the original or whatever. Like it's so polished and and so like. To me, because I read this when I read the story originally, I didn't have all this other iconography in it. It, it is this weird jumble. Of like I'm waiting for like Guillermo del Toro to try it, or like Tarsem, you know, or like like a filmmaker who weirdly uses practical and CG in in a more in in an interesting way. Because so much of Alice to me is tangible and touchable, and like you have to see it and. And and other parts of me are very painted uh, in my mind are very like painted and painterly and illustrative and everything is just all the other adaptations I've seen of it are just neither one gets the balance that I've pictured in my head for so long. Well, it's also a struggle because she's thirteen, or and it's it's seemingly episodic. And right. so, you know, everybody's, you know, that's tried to take it on, including myself, is, you know, trying to find a structure that allows that story, the reluctant hero story, to play out in a way that um, you can really suspend disbelief and buy into. Well, I mean, you know, it's, you know, Stranger Things is an Alice in Wonderland story in a weird way, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it all is. like, yeah, we we went into the upside down, and and they cast those kids young, and they, absolutely, they made, it, they made it work, and. um but in television, uh, you have a little bit more opportunity, and certainly when you have a show and even movies that have both young characters and adult characters, then you have that four yeah. quadrants or whatever they talk about. Um, that it's can be con and that show can be nostalgic as an adult, right. and it can feel completely fresh for my you know my thirteen year old. Well, there's so. a weird Ouroboros effect kind of, you know, with, with these IPs where it's like, 
you know, Alice comes across, you know, the, the book is published and, it, you know, it, it comes into the zeitgeist and it inspires all these other works, uh, you know, that the, there is a Alice in Wonderland quality to all of these other different kinds of stories that are being told in different kinds of genres. And it kind of gets absorbed into the zeitgeist in other ways. And all of those things, like, like you said, whether it's a poster in the background or a music cue or whatever, will nod their mm-hmm. roots back to Alice over here. And then eventually it comes back around to, well, now we want to remake the thing that's inspired all the things that inspired us to remake (laughs) the thing. Uh, So when you, when you kind of come back to it, you're like, well, do we, do we remake it using all of the, using all of the iconography of the things that it inspired? Like, Mm -hmm. do we use the visual language of all of the different iterations of Alice to tell a new iteration, or do we have to find some new visual language, you know, to tell that story again, because otherwise it's just like a song that's singing itself. Right. Um, right. So it's, it, and I think that's what you've done so well with in creating out your world is like, you just find another way into it, you know, that, that doesn't, that visualizes it differently and contextualizes it differently. And it feels like Alice without, feeling either too dissimilar or too similar. And I think that's what you guys have been doing brilliantly in your world. So. Well, thank you. I've, you know, been trying to, uh, been trying to expand, um, to push outside of what people know as Wonderland, um, right. whether it's bringing Wonderland to another culture or another timeline, uh, or expanding the geography of Wonder Nations, and certainly with the various characters, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to expand with other writers and other voices that can start to see the world and the foundation of the world that's there in a way that, you know, having done this for 20 years, that I might not be able to do or see. So it's been interesting and exciting to talk to other creators about handing over the universe and saying, what would you do with this, whether it's setting up a new graphic novel or a, or a novel or talking about the television show. And I've been working with one game company and they didn't want to step on any of the story that had already been created. So we started talking about the the backstory or the world before the books. And Mm -hmm. it was very exciting to give a little framework for what my thinking was and where, and then have them expand on it and get excited as well that, oh, we have the freedom, the creator is giving us this freedom um, in terms of how this game and what the game story, what the game engine is going to be. So that whole collaborative effort, um, whether it was, you know, working with you in the room or collaborating on a graphic novel and now working on a game is very exciting to, to, to have a world that is big enough and a bright enough canvas that it attracts other creators. So, yeah. Well, I think, you know, even looking at like something as recent as, you know, into the spider verse, for example, Mm. like, you know, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, you know, even just that little section where they dip into, was it Moonbatten, you know, um, and and you sit there and you go, okay, for 10 minutes of the movie, we're going to show you what Spider-Man through an East Indian lens looks like. Yeah. Actually gives it a lot. There's a lot to explore there, you know, and you realize like, oh, even just telling the same story with a slightly different aesthetic or cultural view gives it all these new layers it's yeah. not it's not just a, a a quick glow up you know it gives it a real depth and like i could have spent two hours in just that world alone learning what that kind of spider-man story would would be like and so mm-hmm. you know it's it's great that you do that that you give other you know other authors voices to to sort of explore these things from from other angles like that because there's a lot to find there I think. and as you know you have an open invitation <laughs> Thank you. So, but I know you also have a lot of your own original work. Um, tell me, um, you know, you're obviously on this big show, but you've written a lot of pilots. I know before the strike, you were, you know, you're pitching projects. So, tell me where you're at with uh, with some of your original work, whether it's the short stories. I remember you did something called the Survivors. It's it's interesting. I keep like 
I would do these, I, I had a run there where I would, I would write these pilots that, you know, I would like send it to my reps and then they would go, yeah, no, I don't think anyone wants to do anything with that. And, <laughs> and, and then like a year later, you know, some other version of it would be huge, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I had written a script called Survivors. This was back in 2000 and, oh God, uh, 2014, I think maybe. And it was very, it was very much about a support group for the survivors of various horror movie scenarios. Uh, you know, and at the time I was like patting myself on the back for like, Oh, this is such an original idea, man. This is great. And uh, you know, I, I, you know, my reps at the time were like, Oh, this is a little meta. I don't know if it's going to work, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, years later, it's like, how many seasons deep are we into American horror story? And there's a novel now, a uh, terrific novel um, called Final Girl Support Group that came out years later. It was very much, you know, it, it not very different in many ways, but, you know, touched upon the same concept. And I had written, a, uh, my, you know, still to this day, my proudest, the script that I'm proudest of, the pilot I'm proudest of is um, uh, is a restaurant drama. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you told me about that. That, uh, you know, about about two brothers who couldn't be more different, forced to come back together after the death of their father. Yeah, I'm and, watching it, the bear. I'm, I'm watching yeah, and, it. At, uh, and, you know, at <laughs> the season time, two is excellent. By the way, episode six, you did a great job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and at the time, all my, you know, my reps were like, nobody wants a food show. Nobody wants, <laughs> nobody wants a restaurant show. You know, and so, uh, you know, it's just all you can, all you could do is write what you're passionate about writing, you know, and, and keep writing, um, which is, I think, is is the problem I'm struggling with now, where it's like, the 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 strike is such a stressful time that it sort of tempts you to to take a break and to to think you know I'll just okay I'll put my pens down and you know because it, I can't do anything with what I make anyway or blah 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 but like that muscle can atrophy so mm -hmm. you know you have to keep you have to pick up the pen and and work at it every day do you have an original a new uh, original idea that you're working on uh, as a pilot um or um, are you I've got a feature. I've got a horror feature okay. uh, I'm working on now, uh, which I can't say too much about. But it, every day I go to write it, I kind of shake my head and think, why am I? This is insane. This idea is crazy. We'll see. You know, hopefully there'll be some some life in that at some point. And, uh, you know, um, Terry Metalis and I uh, have, uh, you know, a number of things um, on deck uh, that we'd like to do uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do once the sky's clear uh, and the strike is over and we're able to, to, to get back um, together. So, uh, you know, we, we have a, um, we have a version of Phantom of the Opera. Uh, that's a, a retelling of the Phantom of the Opera that we've been wanting to do forever. We'd love to find a way to make that happen. Um, you know, Terry certainly wants to keep on uh, exploring the world of Star Trek. So, yeah. you know, hopefully the powers that be will let us do that. So, you know, it's uh writing a new pilot, writing a new uh, feature, and then kind of hoping when this all, uh, when this all resolves itself, we can get back in a room. Cause that's really where I love to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I love people. I, I love sitting in a room with smart people coming up with cool stuff. Um, uh, yeah. You were very, in the room that we put together, you, you were the first to jump in almost every time you always had, you know, well, what, this is what I'm thinking. Or it's because I'm obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are very obnoxious, which is <laughs> such a superpower. I got to say, I, I wish I was a lot more obnoxious having witnessed you uh, jumping in. And But, you know, it was a driver. It was a driver of the room. Uh, it was super helpful to be fearless in, show, in sharing an idea that could, people could jump on the back of and start to riff off of. So... You need you need that, and it's not no surprise that um, you know you've gone from show to show, and that you and Terry have a you know a strong partnership and um, understanding with it, each other. I, I think it actually has a lot to do. <laughs> I'm starting to believe this. Maybe I'm wrong, but like I feel like it has a lot to do with having worked on a time travel show. Um, because when you're working in time travel, you have to like you're not only do you have to have these like big creative sci-fi ideas and couple that with emotional character driven ideas like you have to well if we do this then it undis that it, uh, it undoes this because he goes back in time and and so that wouldn't work and then so you have to your brain teaches itself to iterate really quickly you know to have a really good idea explore it realize if it contradicts something else in the time travel if it does throw it out go back because you can't lose the time 
Uh, and then if it works, great, go to the next idea. And, and I found that a lot of the writers who came from 12 Monkeys have kind of all described this as they've entered subsequent rooms, this sense of feeling like they're, they're, they're going faster than everybody. <laughs> they're time traveling. <laughs> that, that, that like, yeah. like, Oh, I can pitch, I'll pitch 10 things, yeah. you know, and maybe other people in the, in the room, like have pitched like one. And I feel like the asshole, like, I feel like, Oh my God, am I, am I, am I like bullying my way into the room? Am I being too loud? Am I pitching too much? And I think it's just because we've taught our brains to like, iterate and calculate the math of a story beat, you know, into multiple timelines and it makes your brain faster, you know? And so it really is a testament to like, the more you do this and the more you do it with great people who challenge you to be better and where you can take half of your idea and half of their idea and make something that's better than either idea and then do that 10, 12 times a day, you know, like, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and, and I, there's nothing I love more than working with great writers. Well, you can so. feel the muscle. You can just feel the yeah, muscle developing. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and the, that's, that's very inspirational. Um, hey, I, I was thinking, you know, you wrote that story for me, the Hatter story, and it, wa- it turned out, you wrote it separate originally, and then I was working on this, the the graphic novel, the the one, the nature of wonder, and it it ended up to be a perfect. I, I think I asked you, can I use this as the yeah. end of the of the uh, of the graphic novel? And then I credited you, gave you a credit of of guest um, writer, right? But didn't put your name on the specific pages. So <laughs> I'd like to rectify that if you don't mind, <laughs> and uh, and take your pages with the pages from the script and put them on my. I have a website that has circle and share right. them if you're if you're cool sure, with yeah, that of course i'm happy happy to yeah. and 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 if there's anything that uh, uh story that uh you'd like to share with uh readers like more than happy to post something you know i have had a uh gr- you know delightful time chatting with you Thank reconnecting you. and uh talking about the business and um your 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 career and uh, fingers crossed for the strike and Fingers crossed for this uh, this new idea that uh, uh, that the the new reps will understand that it's cutting right, edge. And right. let, let's get ahead of the zeitgeist this yeah, time. Right. Let's, let's be let's the zeitgeist. Be the other side of the curve, right? <laughs> um, no, I mean, thank you for having me. This I, mean, I always love reconnecting with you, and it's great to be able to have like a long form conversation like this uh, yeah. and really kind of dig into it. So, yeah. thank you for. Ha- I really this was a blast. Yeah, so. same. So. Um, We'll be back in touch, and uh, thanks a lot, Chris. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. See you later, man.